The MacBook Pro M1 has been in my hands for the last three months. And in that time, I've had a chance to test everything I need from a computer. And I feel like I've gotten to know this guy pretty well. We've had some good times and some frustrating moments in the beginning, but what are my impressions after using this laptop as my main computer for the last three months? And can I recommend it? Hey, I'm Jerry. And yes, Apple's new computers with their very own Apple Silicon chip came out about three months ago to some crazy fanfare. And honestly, deservingly so. You've seen all the benchmarks by now, which show the M1 MacBook Pro, Air, and Mini just destroying some other computers that cost twice as much or more. Whether that's in generic tests like Geekbench or Cinebench, or so-called real-world tests like video exporting. And the short story is that these M1 Macs are stupid fast for almost anything. The MacBook Pro M1 has an eight-core CPU with four performance cores and four efficiency cores an eight core GPU, which Apple claims is the fastest integrated GPU. And then there's the 16 core neural engine. Admittedly, I have zero idea what a neural engine does, but it does help with specific tasks like machine learning and developers can use it to perform super complex transactions like auto sharpening in Pixelmator Pro. Now, let me just explain how I use my computer real quick. Yes, I do video editing, and that is by far the most stress that I put on a computer. I've done some basic game tests with Minecraft and Fortnite, but I'm not really a gamer. And I'd say that I've probably spent about four to six hours testing games over the last three months, which is, you know, nothing. I spend a bulk of my time in Safari, email, Word, OneNote, messages, notes, Citrix, remote desktop. So it's entirely plausible that my experiences can be different from yours. But for my uses, three months in, I've had basically zero issues with performance using the MacBook Pro M1. All of my apps open quickly and run just as they should. Even apps that have not been optimized to work with the M1 work great, like the games I just mentioned. They pretty much just run with the help of Rosetta translation in the background, and you never even realize it. You wouldn't even know that there's apps running in a non-native way in most cases without looking at Activity Monitor and seeing. As you can see in my Activity Monitor, I only have a few remaining apps that I use daily that need to be updated like Microsoft OneDrive, LastPass, and my Logitech mouse utility compared to a couple of months ago. Most of Microsoft's apps have been updated like Word, Excel, and Edge. Chrome has been updated and even Adobe is working on updates for Photoshop and Premiere, you know, etc. And actually this jump to Apple Silicon made me take another look at Pixelmator Pro in lieu of Photoshop and I absolutely love it and I have fully made the switch over from Photoshop. Pixelmator is really optimized for the M1 and can do some really cool, fast machine learning edits. And I don't need to worry about installing that super heavy Adobe Cloud Suite anymore. So that's nice. So to condense that section down, the performance and the stability of macOS and apps on the MacBook Pro M1 has been outstanding with no lingering issues. Apps feel snappy to open, and I don't feel limited in any way by the performance of the MacBook Pro. In a minute, I'll discuss some of the issues that I had seen in my first week. Now, with all of that performance and stability, I wanna talk about the heat and fan, or lack thereof. Yes, there is a fan inside this MacBook Pro M1, but I can honestly say that I've only heard it less than maybe five times in the last three months. You just cannot say that about any Intel-based laptop at all. The MacBook Pro M1's fan is so quiet that I'm not even sure that it's actually running. I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of utility out there that can show me the fan speed on the M1. Oh wait, if we look at the Sensei app, you can see the fan is showing zero RPM. That's with two browsers with multiple tabs, messages, mail, word, and some other apps open. This thing is just dead silent almost all of the time. I've not found a guaranteed way to get the fans to spin up on this MacBook Pro. My Final Cut Pro exports are not usually large enough to make this thing break a sweat, and even running Cinebench for 30 minutes will only push the fans to about 50 to 60% most of the time. When comparing the MacBook Pro M1 to the i9 16-inch MacBook Pro running Cinebench on both of these computers, the fans on the 16-inch MacBook Pro were running at over 5,000 RPMs and were much louder and more annoying than the MacBook Pro M1, which was only running at about 3,200 RPM. Here, let me show you an example of the 16-inch MacBook Pro and the M1 MacBook Pro running with their fans during a Cinebench test.
Fan noise is not the only thing to worry about when using a laptop, there's also heat. If you're going to be using a laptop for hours on end from a couch or something, you don't want your legs to be slowly roasted or hands to be sweaty. To show the difference in temperature, I let both the MacBook Pro M1 and the 16 inch MacBook Pro sit asleep for one hour. Then I booted them and used them for about 20 minutes to do similar things like browse, check email, and open a few documents. The MacBook Pro M1 temperature was about 77 degrees on the keyboard and the 16 inch MacBook Pro was about 84 degrees. The room itself was a little chilly at about 68 degrees. When running the previous Cinebench tests, the MacBook Pro M1 got up to 95 degrees on the keyboard and the 16 inch MacBook Pro got up to 108 degrees. That's a pretty big difference. But that's enough comparing the M1 MacBook Pro to the 16 inch. But I just wanted to show that the M1 MacBooks are very comfortable to use in terms of heat and fan noise. Then there's the battery life. You've heard it by now, crazy claims of insane all day battery life on the M1 MacBooks. Apple says you can get up to 17 hours of web surfing on the MacBook Pro M1. I don't know about you, but I could not test it for that long. But the battery life is amazing and I totally believe it's possible. Here is an example of just couch surfing for almost three hours. I was checking YouTube stats, shopping, researching, just all over the web, and the battery dropped only 4%. So yeah, I think you can get a lot of web surfing in on this thing, but what if you're actually working? Here's an example of a typical workday for me using all of the apps I've talked about in this video. Web, office apps, remote access with Citrix, some Final Cut Pro, and photo editing. This went on for almost nine hours straight, and I was only at 35%. If I were using any other laptop, I would have gotten maybe four hours total or max while working that way. If you take out the photo and video editing, I probably would have been above 50%. So it's totally possible to use this laptop for web, email, and office apps and probably get two days out of it, which means you can just pick up your laptop and go, leaving the battery anxiety at home. So that's all of the internal stuff and I wanna to touch on just a couple of physical and external features like the screen. It's amazing. I'm a big fan of the Retina displays on the MacBook Pros. It scales everything to what I feel like is the correct size. It's bright at 500 nits, and it's got some amazing colors. I'm sure there's more accurate displays out there, but this display is very pleasing and enjoyable to use. Some people would argue that the bezels are too big for 2021, but I honestly don't have a problem with these bezels. I feel like they're just fine, and when I'm working, I don't even see them. Of course, smaller bezels, in a new design would be nice, but I just don't care about these. The keyboard is great. I'm not a big keyboard connoisseur, but I do like the Magic Keyboards. They of course changed out and got rid of all of the butterfly keyboards and they say that everything is you know, rocking the same Magic Keyboard, but I still feel like the external Magic Keyboard is a little bit better and has a little bit more travel. I can type comfortably on the built-in keyboard on the MacBook Pro and it does what I need, so it's, it's great. The touch bar, I could do without. I don't wanna dwell on it too much, but I prefer physical keys, and at a minimum, I've changed the touch bar to always show the same function keys. I do like that I can add the do not disturb button and the dictation button, just like they have on the new M1 Air. The trackpad is exactly what you expect from Apple. It's big, it's glass, it's got multi-touch, and it works better than any other laptop trackpad out there, period. The MacBook Pro trackpad does make a different sound than the trackpad on the MacBook Air, which is a little bit smaller, but on the Pro, the trackpad makes more of a metal, metallic clanking or tinking sound, like tink, 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 and it gets a little bit annoying to me. The air sounds more like a dull thud click, which is better in my opinion. I'm not sure if this is just how the haptic engine is made or if Apple purposely makes the sounds different between the two laptops, but I prefer the sound of the air much better than the trackpad sound on the Pro. I know, stupid thing to complain about, but I gotta find something I don't like about this MacBook Pro M1. The only other hardware features I can think of are the speakers, mic, and webcam. Apple says that the webcam is better, and I guess it is, but I don't use it often enough to make a real observation. The camera on my iPad Pro is miles ahead, so I use that for web calls. I can also say that the mic does seem to be doing a better job at picking up my voice on calls, and the speakers on the 13-inch MacBook Pro are pretty good. External speakers are always going to be better, but they're not bad. As a comparison, the speakers on my 12.9 inch iPad Pro from 2018 are both louder and clearer with better bass to my ears compared to the 13 inch Pro. Now, I do wanna follow up on my first week performance issues video. You may have seen on one of my previous videos, 
I was experiencing some issues within my first week. When I got the M1 MacBook Pro and Air, I was installing everything I could to test and see what was working, what was not, and checking performance against my other MacBooks and my iMac. When it came time to edit my first video on these machines, I ran into major performance issues that prevented just the timeline on Final Cut Pro from working. The audio would stop playing and they basically became unusable for a period of time. The next day, I installed Big Sur 11.1 and since then I've not seen any of those issues return. Looking back on that, I'm guessing that what happened is I probably ran out of space with APFS snapshots, which cleared out overnight. And then the 11.1 update probably helped clear out some of the other issues I was having. I also talked about the speed of external USB-C drives being much slower than on my Intel machines, and that's still a problem. I was getting around 910 megabytes per second with my Samsung T7 SSD, whereas the M1 Max we're only getting about 780 megabytes per second, which is a pretty steep drop. To me, this seems like a limitation of Apple's USB or Thunderbolt implementation on the M1 chip, and I'm curious to see if this is addressed or if this is fixed in the next generation of Apple's chips. But to be clear, even though the max speeds for the USB seem to be less than what I had on Intel machines, it's still plenty fast and has not affected my workflow. Then there are the display issues in the first week video and the two follow-up videos. I found numerous issues with external displays when connected to the M1 MacBook Pro and Air. No matter if I was using DisplayPort, HDMI, or Thunderbolt, I had issues when waking from sleep and the display being blank, to crazy green screens, limits to refresh rate, and completely messed up resolutions that spanned even across into my internal display. I was using an expensive but amazing BenQ PD3220U display and I went and bought different Samsung displays to try and rule out a specific display issue. I tried different cords and adapters, and I tried to rule all of that out. No matter what I did, I had constant problems when connecting displays or waking them from sleep. Luckily, the Big Sur 11.2 update solved at least some of those issues. Since 11.2, I've had no issues using an external display on my MacBook Pro M1 via DisplayPort. HDMI still has some random connectivity issues, and I can't try Thunderbolt because I returned that expensive monitor that I couldn't use. For me, I'm running along just fine now with my M1 and an external display, and I hope to get a nicer display soon, but let me know below if 11.2 fixed your display issues, especially if you have a USB-C or Thunderbolt display. Now, with all of that information, can I recommend the 2020 MacBook Pro M1? It's a great computer that has become my primary device. This laptop is the fastest overall laptop I've ever used. Everything feels snappy, and it never feels limited, even with non-optimized applications. I use it for work, YouTube, and pretty much everything else. My normal setup is at my desk with an external mouse, monitor, keyboard, and speakers, but I love that I could just unplug it and take all of this power with me and not even need to worry about plugging it in. This laptop is not yet perfect, though. I still have some concerns with external displays. The webcam is still 720p for some reason, and I want cellular connectivity, dang it. But three months in, this is the best computer I have ever owned. And if I needed to buy another laptop today, I would not buy a MacBook Pro M1. I bet you didn't see that coming, but I did not misspeak. I think that the MacBook Air M1 is the better value overall because the same M1 chip is in both computers and that $300 price difference is better spent on 16 gigs of RAM and additional storage versus the little bit brighter screen and a touch bar. The performance and experience between the M1 Pro and the M1 Air is pretty much identical between them. And if you think you need more power than the Air, you should just wait for the next version of the MacBook Pro. But hey, that's just my advice. What do you think? If you bought a MacBook Pro M1, has your experience been the same as mine? If you had to do it over, would you get the Air? Let me know below. If you haven't seen my crazy display tests where I tested all combinations of displays and cables and computers, then you should definitely check out this video right over here. Hit the thumbs up button if you liked it. Hit subscribe if you want, and I'll see you next time.